we kick off the summer of 2023 this week, it will be our first full season of freedom from the pandemic in over three years. But the lingering impacts of the virus continue to weigh on thousands of Americans suffering from post-COVID symptoms. We'll reveal the latest data. And accessing high quality health care has historically posed challenges for those living in remote parts of the country. We'll discuss the reasons why and some potential solutions to improve the overall quality and length of life for all rural Americans. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on tonight, we have a very special guest joining us. Dr. Jonathan Perlin, the President and CEO of the Joint Commission, will join our conversation. Dr. Gold, we have a lot to unpack tonight, but it sounds like we're going to begin with some vaccine news for our audience. Good evening to you. Where are we going to start tonight? Absolutely. Uh, first, uh, it's always a uh, great pleasure to be with you in the audience tonight, and we are so fortunate to be able to introduce Dr. Perlin in a few minutes. But let's get right into the data, because I have several important messages that I'd like to share with our audience this evening. So if we can move into the graphics. Uh, as you said, there is some very important vaccine news, and that is that the Food and Drug Administration and the ACIP, the Advisory Council, on uh, immunization practices uh, has recommended that for the fall that the COVID vaccine should be focused on the most recent variants that we're looking at, which are the XBB subtypes of the Omicron variant. And as we'll see when we look at the data in a few minutes, that's exactly the type of uh, COVID that we're seeing across the United States right now. So this will hopefully send a very clear message to all of the vaccine manufacturers so that when you and I roll up our sleeves this fall to get our flu vaccines, that this new COVID vaccine specific to the XBB subtype uh, will be available to us widely across uh, the United States. So getting into the data right now, uh, starting off with the hospitalization rates in the U.S., uh, you can see we're down to one per 100,000. The map looks almost completely pale, which is a really good sign with very little concentration of hospitalization. Uh, interestingly, Delaware has now popped up to the top in, uh, in cases per 100,000 hospitalized. Washington, D.C., uh, followed by Missouri, Arkansas, and Pennsylvania. But these numbers are just a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of what we saw uh, in previous months during the pandemic. When we look at the daily COVID hospitalizations in the United States, they continue to fall, uh, as do the number in intensive care units, but they haven't quite gotten down to baseline. And that's because, as we can see in this graphic, the 70 years and older and the 60 to 69 year old populations still remain at high risk. Overall, about 3,200 and 50, 3,248 to be exact, uh, were hospitalized on June 12th. The data is about a week old, as you know. And the 14-day running average is now uh, down again. It's down a full 7 percent uh, per 100,000 uh, in the United States. So again, uh, while it's not where we want it to say this is totally in the rearview mirror, it is way, way, way more favorable and continues to fall uh, in a in a very favorable way. When we look at the distribution of the various subtypes of the Omicron variant, uh, you can see uh, that the 1.5 subtype of XBB is now about 40 percent of all of the uh, subtypes we're seeing in the United States. It's followed by the 1.16, which is at about 18 percent, and the 1.9, uh, which is about 12.5 percent. So clearly, the immunologic characteristics of these XBB subtypes is exactly what the vaccine should be targeting for the future. And I am frankly very reassured that this was the decision made uh, by the FDA to message uh, the manufacturers. Indeed, when we look across the United States, you can see very clearly uh, that the XBB subtype, particularly the 1.5, is widely present across the United States uh, that we see in the dark blue and the median blue shades. And so as long as we don't see much progression or the introduction of a new subtype of the Omicron variant, 
uh, the vaccine decisions will be extremely helpful and hopefully we'll get not just our older and most vulnerable citizens uh, immunized, but our school age kids uh, and everybody in between uh, to keep us out of the hospital uh, and working. If we look at some of the changes uh, in mortality, the data uh, seems to be progressing in the right direction. Week over week, we're seeing falls in case fatality rates uh, widely across the United States. Uh, you know, if we look at it by state, uh, overall, the U.S. Uh, in the last week had 704 deaths, or 0.2 per 100,000. Uh, interestingly, uh, my home state, Nebraska and New Mexico and Arkansas and Oklahoma, are now almost exactly equal at 0.5 uh, per 100,000. I wouldn't put too much stock in these numbers in the sense that this is anecdotal reporting. It's frequently done in batches. It's the trends that really make a difference. It's not a single weekly number. And indeed, if you look at the graphic on the far right of your screen, you see the red line and the waving black line, which is the month by month uh, pneumonia, influenza, and other respiratory death rates uh, that we see have almost become one and the same. And so while we're still having about 700 deaths per week uh, due to COVID, uh, the balance uh, has come roughly uh, equivalent into where we would normally be at this time of the year, which would be at the end of the flu season and before the beginning of the next flu season, the RSV season and the other viral pneumonia. So a lot is going to depend on what happens late summer, early fall, and that's where the new vaccines are going to be critically important. Uh, if we look at the overall vaccination rates uh, in the United States, uh, both for the boosters uh, seen here in amber uh, and the original primary series uh, seen here in green, uh, there's really been no change uh, since these vaccine decisions have been made with very, very little additional adoption other than those that are at high risk, those that are living in long-term care facilities, and those are really at the extremes of age, or interestingly, those that are going to travel. Now, the subject of our show today, Christina, as you referenced, uh, is the quality of safe, effective, and patient-centered care that we offer to rural America. At the end of the day, those are our goals. We want our health care system to be safe. We want it to be effective and affordable and accessible. And we want it to be patient-centered. So in preparation for introducing Dr. Perlin, I thought I would share uh, some uh, information. The first is to understand the quadruple aim of the health care system. This is rural, urban, uh, all across our nation. And in the center of this is to have satisfied patients, patients that get good quality, accessible, uh, and affordable care. We want to have improved population health. We want to be sure that we do everything we can to make sure that we bend and reduce the cost of that care. And we also need to be sure that those that provide the care, the doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists, and so many others, uh, have a good quality life in the sense that they feel satisfied uh, that they are delivering that very high quality care because we know uh, that moral injury and that burnout, uh, that depression and other factors that can affect the health care providers will also affect the quality and the safety of the care, increase medical errors and so many other important considerations. If we look at rural America, Again, just reminding our audience that one in five Americans uh, live in rural communities. That's 57 million people. And if you remember this map, uh, please recall that in the central part of the United States, in the dark green, that's the densest collection of rural counties. And if you look at the coasts where the very bright red counties are indicated, those are the highest population density. Uh, and the tan and the light green are someone in between. And I ask you to focus on this map of our nation, because when we look at delivery of care, quality of care, safety of care, it mirrors this pattern almost exactly. So this represents some survey data uh, where rural Americans were asked uh, about their access to care and the quality of care. And 68% of them uh, said 
uh, that was related to urgent care, uh, that the accessibility was good uh, and accessible. But only 38 percent said that they thought the quality of that urgent care was very good or excellent. Uh, if you look at long-term care, slightly less than that. If you look at chronic care, which includes dialysis and diabetes, 54 percent said it was accessible or very accessible, but only 35 percent said it was good or quality. Even worse, in the area of mental and behavioral health care, where 25 percent said it was accessible and 18 percent said that their mental and behavioral health care uh, was very good or excellent. And if you look at specialty care, such as surgical care, uh, neurology, high-risk obstetrics, and other such things, only 33 percent in rural America, and again, this is survey data, uh, said it was accessible or very accessible, and only 35 percent uh, said that they thought the quality was very good or excellent. And if you look at that broken down uh, compared in other categories, so uh, this is, again, uh, survey data. Uh, comparing rural uh, survey results in the dark blue and high-density urban uh, results uh, in the green. In primary care, in terms of access, 34 percent said that their primary care access in rural America uh, was acceptable or good, uh, versus 62 percent in the larger cities. If you look at dental care, it's 32 versus 65. And again, if you look at mental health, it's 33 uh, percent versus 62 uh, percent in the larger communities. Again, demonstrating the disparities in access to care. Uh, this is more data uh, looking at several questions. Uh, for instance, uh, in the upper left, you see rural residents are less likely to describe themselves as being in excellent or good health. 69 percent said so in rural America, 80 percent said so in urban America. If you look at uh, health care benefits by their employers, uh, 66 percent uh, characterized that as uh, good uh, in rural America versus 75 percent in urban America. And in the upper right, rural residents are less likely to have health insurance, 81 percent in rural America versus 90 percent uh, in urban America. When we look at the map uh, at the same uh, rankings, uh, you can see that looking at 43 different metrics, which included the average monthly insurance cost, the quality of public hospital systems, the share of insured and uninsured children, life expectancy, and so many more, the very highest rankings are shown in blue, led by the state of Minnesota. And the very lowest rankings are shown in dark red, with the lowest actually being uh, the state of Alaska. But there's a very, very clear pattern uh, that we see across our nation. A lot of this is actually related to where we have our health care professionals. And as we've talked previously on this broadcast, Christina, you can see that if you look at total physicians per 10,000 people, 13 in rural America versus 33 in urban America, and this is adjusted per population. If you look at obstetrics, 6 percent of our nation's obstetric obstetrician gynecologists work in rural America. Again, don't forget, that's about 20 percent of the population. If you look at primary care providers, again, similar differences, 5 in rural America for every 8 in urban America. Very, very significant healthcare professional uh, differences. And indeed, if you look at the total number of healthcare professionals per 100,000 population uh, in the United States, you can see in dark blue the highest density. Uh, look at the Pacific Northwest, uh, look at the Northeast, the Mid Atlantic, versus the lowest density of healthcare professionals per 100,000 uh, in the U.S. And as you see, that's in Texas. Uh, all through Mississippi, Alabama, uh, and Georgia, again, where some of the worst health care outcomes happen to be. And as we've shown earlier, but just to remind our audience, if you look at any parameter of outcome, this one happens to be overall COVID mortality since the beginning of the pandemic, just to choose one. If you remember that map of rural counties in America, 
if you remember the map of healthcare professional shortage areas, that shows up in the dark red and the amber here on this map. If you look at infant mortality, which we discussed at great length with Dr. Anderson Berry recently, uh, you can see, again, the exact same pattern associated with access to high-risk OB care, associated with lack of access to neonatal care, associated with so many other risk factors uh, that we unpacked on one of our earlier shows. So just to play the history tapes back a bit, it was in 1999 that the Institute of Medicine came forward with their first look at quality and safety uh, in rural and urban America, and they brought forward the issue of patient safety and medical errors. Indeed, at that time, they estimated that 2% of all deaths in our nation were due to preventable medical errors. In 2001, the Institute of Medicine uh, presented what's called Crossing the Quality Chasm, which was an urgent call for changes to the healthcare process to improve quality and access and to set up a framework for healthcare quality and healthcare improvement, bringing both the patient and the family uh, into the equation. And there is little question that even to this day that healthcare errors uh, are uh, very important, both errors of omission and commission. An error of omission occurs as a result of an action that is not taken. An error of commission occurs as a result of wrong actions. So if you look at typical medication errors and near misses, you can see these can be errors in prescribing, errors in dispensing, errors in preparation and administration, and then errors in follow-up and monitoring of different types of medications. And the more medications that are prescribed, the higher risk of errors of omission and errors of commission. So the National Academy of Health Systems has a number of priorities, nine of them uh, to be exact, and this was recently published in a discussion paper that is part of the National Academy of Medicines emerging stronger after COVID. And they identified several levers, several ways that our nation can improve quality and safety affecting all of our rural and urban communities. The first, which we're going to discuss at length uh, with Dr. Perlin in a few minutes, is to facility, survey, certify, and accredit uh, our hospitals, healthcare delivery systems, clinics, ambulatory centers, etc. The second is to have reproducible quality measures, incentives, and payment models. The third area that the National Academy brought forward was public ratings and rankings of providers and facilities. And the fourth is quality improvement learning and action networks. But these were the four areas that the National Academy thought was so important. And so before we have the opportunity to introduce our guest, I thought I would just set the stage uh, for Dr. Perlin to say that the Joint Commission's mission, which Dr. Perlin leads, is to continuously improve health care for the public in collaboration with other stakeholders by evaluation, health care organizations, and by inspiring them to excel in providing safe and effective care of the highest quality and the highest value, a very, very lofty and very important mission. The vision statement uh, for the Joint Commission uh, goes on to say that all people always experience the safest, highest quality, best value health care across all settings. And according to their web pages, uh, they directly accredit and certify over 22,000 healthcare organizations in more than 70 countries worldwide with over 2,000 resources for patient safety and quality. And so I hope our audience appreciates that there are many different aspects of maintaining quality and safety in our rural communities of our healthcare, and the Joint Commission is a critically important component of that. And so, Christina, I very much appreciate being able to address this important subject with our audience this evening and very, very much look forward to the call-ins that we'll have. Absolutely. Let's get that number up on the screen. As a matter of fact, make sure you have an opportunity to call in. It's 877-731-6733. And in addition to your medical questions tonight, we ask that you give us a call. Describe the quality of health care 
where you are. How would you rate it? What could be done better? What areas are you already seeing success? We'd love to hear from you, Rural America. So give us a call, 877-731-6733. We also know we have quite a few people joining us tonight, joining us from the big cities. We'd also love to hear from you. Your perspective is also important, and we're always trying to bridge the city and the country here at RFD TV. Dr. Gold, you brought up some amazing points. I would ask you, though, post-pandemic, we know that there have been some shortages of medical staff, and we know this has been a big topic. Did COVID exacerbate some of the challenges that we were already up against in rural health care, and to what degree would you say? I would say it's very variable, Christina, more so in rural communities than in urban communities uh, for several reasons. One, it reduced the number of healthcare professionals. So a number of people that were thinking about retiring uh, retired. Uh, and so whether it's physicians, nurses, pharmacists, dentists, therapists, counselors, behavioral health specialists, etc. cetera, uh, you know, uh, as I look at the, just our own home state here of Nebraska, of the 93 counties, 19 of them, as of last year's survey, do not have a single primary care physician. 49 of them do not have a single board-certified uh, OB-GYN. 50-some-odd of them do not have a single board-certified generalist pediatrician. And so that's critically important. But the other very, very important piece that has happened as a result of the pandemic uh, is that people didn't have access to hospitals, clinics, diagnostic testing, cancer screening, et cetera. So as a result of that, there's a combination of low supply of healthcare professionals and very high demand for screening tests, such as mammography and colonoscopy and so many others, uh, as well as routine, well, baby care, immunizations, uh, et cetera. And so we have a large pent-up demand with a big backlog at the same time our ability to have the capacity to get some of those patients through and cared for particularly in some of the smaller rural communities uh, is a real challenge and you know I can tell you we are working on that here in our community constantly but that challenge is not going to go away immediately and it's just a call to action for our farmers and ranchers uh, in rural America, and frankly, as well as you and uh, all of you in the big cities, uh, to be sure that you can secure access to health care because you never know when you're going to really need it. It's either going to take a slip or fall or chest pain or, you know, you're at a College World Series game uh, and you develop double vision or a headache that won't go away. And knowing who to call, when to call, and knowing you have access is critically important. Absolutely. These things can creep up on us when we least expect them to. So that is really great guidance tonight. And we're just getting started. Give us a call, 877-731-6733. We'd love to hear from you. And stay with us. After the break, we're going to bring in tonight's special guest, Dr. Jonathan Perlin, the president and CEO of the Joint Commission. He's going to join our conversation and take your calls. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome tonight's special guest, Dr. Jonathan Perlin, the President and CEO of the Joint Commission, the Joint Commission Resources, and Joint Commission International. Dr. Perlin, thank you so much for joining us. You have such an important job. Let's start by giving our viewers a little bit of an overview of the work you do and its significance, if you will. First, Christina and Dr. Gold, what a delight to be with you and thank you for the mission of service that you provide to uh, rural America. Just so incredibly important. The statistics that Dr. Gold um, described really put in perspective how important the work of the Joint Commission is in terms of assuring quality and, uh, and safety. Uh, I think I have some sense of rural America. And a couple of jobs ago, I had the great privilege of leading the VA health system. Uh, and of course, the VA has responsibility for veterans from um, the most urban parts of the country to the most rural. And uh, I saw some of those most rural and um, I believe I have some appreciation for the challenges. Joint Commission is an independent, not-for-profit organization dedicated to continuously improving healthcare. Uh, as you heard um, uh, in our vision statement, it's really that all people always experience the safest, highest quality, highest value of healthcare across all settings. And I would tell you this, our work is not done. 
our work is not done in rural America. But um, there are certain things where we know our work is, is making a difference. Uh, I, I blew out my hip and had to have a, a hip replacement. And while I um, had some questions about the procedure, by virtue of the organization being joint commission accredited, I knew that that organization would be abiding by appropriate infection prevention practices and that one of the things I wouldn't have to worry about would, would, would be that. Now, um, there's still continuous opportunity in terms of improving quality, uh, but um, our, our work at Joint Commission is really about three things. Inspiration, uh, focusing all of America, all healthcare roles on improving quality uh, and um, uh, improvement in an organized and sustained manner and accountability. We're not a government organization, we're a, a, a not-for-profit organization, but we help um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, which run the Medicare and the Medicaid programs, um, programs in rural America, federally qualified health centers, and elsewhere, um, as an intermediary. You can't participate in those programs unless you meet certain government requirements. Uh, and we're the organization that makes sure that those requirements are met, as well as requirements that we add that uh, really are focused on the very best practices at any given time uh, in terms of safety and quality. Uh, and let me add another one in there in addition to patient centered, and that's health equity. Uh, Dr. Gold's terrific uh, overview of some of the challenges in quality in rural America point out that we have disparities. We have differences in terms of the quality of outcomes and the experience of care between some of the more urban settings uh, and our most rural settings. Okay, uh, it's fascinating the work that you do. I think of the Better Business Bureau and it's similar to what you're doing because everybody wants to receive that accreditation. I will ask you tonight, um, you mentioned that you led the VA health system, that's huge. I think our audience really needs to understand how important you are and the work that you've done. You know how to stretch a dollar. I think that's what this really comes down to as well in rural America. When it comes to health care, you really have to be able to maximize every single dollar. Tell us a little bit about what you learned leading the VA health system and how you've been able to apply it to your new position. Well, um, uh, Christina, um, we know that a disproportionate number of um, our military service members come from rural America. And so that's not just the opportunity to thank them uh, for their service to our country. Uh, and uh, as the leader of the Veterans Health Administration, um, I, we know that um, using every dollar wisely uh, meant that you could give care to more veterans and deeper care to any particular veteran. But it really ties to the mission of the Joint Commission, because we also know that if you have high quality, you have greater efficiency. Let me give you an example. If you were fixing a tractor, and you fixed it incorrectly because you got the diagnosis wrong, you've not only um, not fixed the tractor, but you've wasted resources. Well, we're talking about something even more profound. We're talking about people's lives. We need to make sure that we work through diagnoses correctly to get to the right diagnosis, and then the most efficient path to the best possible outcome. So show me good quality, and I'll show you efficiency. And so it's really in our interest as a country uh, to not only reduce the number of harm events that Dr. Gold alluded to, but to make sure that we can achieve the straightest path, the best possible care at any given moment. I love that. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I really enjoy that perspective. You would think that we would hear it more often. I really love hearing that from you. 877-731-6733. I bet you're excited about our guest tonight as well. Russ from New York joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Russ. Go right ahead. Thank you, Christina. You have an honest and informative show. Dr. Barry Anderson really opened my eyes to the real pandemic of black maternal health in this country. I just recovered from COVID-23, which I referred to as fatigue, shortness of breath, the same thing as when I had COVID-19. And I imagine it's now called long-haul COVID. But, you know, Dr. Perlin, I would like to ask you, you know, to err is human. And it seems to me during this last pandemic, a lot of people were unwilling to admit mistakes, scientists, doctors, elites, you know, the usual suspects. Um, there was a lot of moral injury done by calling it a pandemic of the unvaccinated. The psychological damage was unheard of. Tr tremendous. I'd like to ask Dr. Perlin, did you notice the effects of COVID-19 worsening veteran suicides because it, they couldn't have access to the Veterans Association? And one more thing, you know, in your joint commission, um, 
vision versus reality, has it gotten better in 20 years? It, those are quite, kind of vague recommendations other than we need to get paid better. And it sure seems like 2% is rather low for the, the, the mistakes. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank, thanks so much. Well, for why don't question. I start, if you don't mind, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Dr. Perlin, just to simply say, from my perspective, been in a healthcare delivery role for decades of my life. I will tell you that things get better every day and every week in terms of quality and safety, access and efficiency. But to your point, Russ, there is no question that the pandemic set us all back quite a bit. So, Dr. Perlin, I'd be very interested in your thoughts on, on this uh, good question from Russ. Yeah, you know, Tara's human really laid out the toll of breaches and quality and, and act of harm. And uh, I'm sorry that the crossing the quality chasm didn't have a better title, uh, but I like to think of it as to care as human, because it really laid out what the essential ingredients of better care were. And those ingredients were safety, timeliness, equity, effectiveness, meaning using the best evidence, efficiency, and being patient-centered. And um, what was important is that, um, you know, to, to the crossing the quality chasm report came out in 2001, so we've now had 22 years. And in fact, I think a measure of the progress is that there was a backslide on things like hospital acquired infections and the like. So the good news is that there clearly was progress since that report came out because we have a, a vocabulary that focuses on safety and quality. It's part of um, our, our common language and, and all of the healthcare. Bad news is we have to ask ourselves, why did quality deteriorate during the pandemic? Um, you know, I, I think we, 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 we saw that some of these processes weren't hardwired. So it begs the question, what can we do to really hardwire quality? I think um, you mentioned moral injury. And um, I, I think uh, one of the groups that um, uh, Dr. Gold also alluded to in the quadruple aim was the caregivers themselves. Uh, it's, we've made so much progress in healthcare. My, my grandmother, for example, who died of a relatively minor heart attack and heart failure, would never have died from the heart attack and, and the heart failure if she could have benefited from the technologies we have now. But uh, as, as we look at um, you know, today's healthcare environment, um, you know, how do we build quality into the woodwork um, uh, so that um, uh, everyone is invested the same way? The caregivers experience moral injury because unlike a heart attack where we can do something, this was a period where we didn't have all the answers. And sure, mistakes were made, uh, and, um, uh, you know, hopefully there is no next time, but I think realistically, all of us have to think about a next time. What did we learn and how did we do better? The whole point of quality is that when you're a patient or I'm a patient, uh, that we build quality into the process. And the whole point of health at a national level and an international level is we learn from past experiences and do better the next time around. And that's why institutions like the University of Nebraska are so incredibly important because they help take that knowledge and put it into practice. Excellent. That leaves a line open for you to call in with your question or comment. The number is 877-731-6733. We're going to Wisconsin where John joins us next. Thanks for joining us, John. Go right ahead. John, are you with us? John, sounds like we may have him, but I think they're going to try to get that worked out upstairs. I will ask you this about the actual accreditation. Does it cost money or the certification? Does it cost anything? Yeah, there is a fee for accreditation. It's um, you know based on the size and complexity of the organization. So small, smaller rural institutions pay less for that. But it's also the ticket of entree into being paid by the Medicare and the Medicaid programs. And um, these are massive programs today. Did you know that the budget of CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, for paying for Medicare and, and Medicaid and things that are covered like dialysis, as an example, is now over $1 trillion. Wow. Uh, and so we're part of the arm that makes sure that money is used as well as possible in terms of achieving the best possible care outcomes. Uh, and I think we'd all agree. Outcomes are better than they were, but they have a ways to go until we, we, we rest comfortably. And they have a further ways to go in rural America. I, I like knowing that, that you're working with Medicare and Medicaid and seeing that accreditation makes them more likely to offer more funding is what it sounds like, which is huge for rural Americans who rely on those programs. 
amazing. It's so it's oh, eye opening tonight what you're bringing to the table. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. It sounds like we got John back on the phone. We didn't give up on you, John. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead. Yes, hello. I have a question for Dr. Gold. Go right ahead, John. Yeah. Yes, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you loud and clear. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, I have a question for Dr. Gold. Well, over the weekend, I noticed when they had this conference in China uh, with some of the American diplomats and all that, they had just about everybody in the crowd had a uh, mask on, and except for the two people who were, I guess, heading the delegates from each side. And I wondered, you know, uh, given that China was the beginning of the Omicron variant or the COVID variant, um, with this new XBB variant, is China experiencing a big explosion in uh, the uh, epidemic again over there? Or what was the deal? I couldn't imagine all these people having a mask on. And I thought, you know, maybe by now they wouldn't be needing it, but. Evidently, they did. And wondered if you could address that and if there's a real concern for the near future, several months down the road. Well, appreciate your calling, John, and that's a good question, and that's the same observation I made by watching some of the video feeds uh, from the meetings uh, that occurred in China. Uh, unfortunately, the, the best answer to your question is we don't really know because there's not a lot of transparency of the data coming out of China, even in the large cities where they're probably monitoring uh, the outbreaks in terms of the subtypes and the variants of uh, COVID that they're seeing. However, uh, don't forget that China had one of the most locked down approaches to the pandemic. They actually tried very hard to have a zero case transmission rate for a long time until they started to depend more heavily uh, on access to vaccines. So it is not surprising to me that particularly in what I would call more public settings where there's videography of President Xi and, and, uh, and other members of the diplomatic parties, that there's a clear attempt to send the message to the Chinese population that use of a mask and preventing transmission is important. I point out to you, sir, as well, that there are still parts of our country, particularly in long-term care facilities, Certainly, for instance, in many hospitals, such as our transplant unit, our bone marrow unit, many parts of our cancer center, where we have patients that are immunocompromised uh, or have other medical comorbidities all the time, where the entire staff uh, and the patients and their families wear masks all the time. So it's really not an all or none. It's just a question about to what extent you're going to have that kind of policy. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I made exactly the same observations that you did. All right. Th- thank you so much for that. Call 877-731-6733. That leaves a line open for you. I want to bring Dr. Perlin back in for a moment because maybe you can explain a little bit better for me, for example, what it's like when you visit or audit a certain health organization. What does that look like? Well, in the immortal words of Yogi Berra, you can see a lot just by watching. You can hear a lot just by listening. Um, it's fascinating. I've worked in healthcare for over 30 years, and I've been on the receiving ends of the surveys, as the accreditation visits are called, the audits. And I've never followed one start to finish. But it's absolutely fascinating to look at processes from the very beginning to the end. You know, an issue here in infection prevention or an issue here and there in fire safety alone may not be significant. But um, let me tell you about one hospital where I personally went on a survey. I was an observer uh, and sworn not to say anything, just to just to observe. And um, in this hospital, um, because of some of the staffing challenges, there were what are called traveling nurses who were, um, you know, just as nice as they could be um, and smart and thoughtful. But they didn't have all the hospital systems down. And when the life safety surveyor asked, "What would you do in case of a fire?" so we called the emergency number. He asked, "Well, what's that number?" And they didn't know. Now he began to look intently at his badge and give them a little cue. And they looked down at their badge and said, oh, there's the number. And you put together certain things like that with some issues about um, 
holes where smoke can get through and the walls with some fire doors that didn't work, with some signage that wasn't necessarily clear, with a plan that meant that patients were supposed to um, go to uh, a particular corner on which the hospital was located at the intersection of two three-lane one-way roads where there was parking and drop-off in the outer lanes. And individually, none of those things were a problem. But when you put it all together and see that, it spells catastrophic risk. And, um, you know, as I said, I was supposed to not say anything, but I couldn't help myself from asking, is a tow truck part of your disaster management plan? And so these are the sorts of things that you can see. And while we all know many of the technical aspects of quality, having people there to trace systems through, and we use a process called tracers when we trace policies, or we trace the course of a patient really lets us see start to finish how well things are working or where there might be a problem. And our goal isn't to you know, give a demerit for something that doesn't happen. Our goal is to share insights into how to make things as safe and effective as possible. Wow. And sometimes you need an outside perspective to do just that because you're looking at the 10,000 foot level. Fascinating. If I'm watching exactly. at home, how do I know if my local health provider is Joint Commission certified or is there a way that I can possibly motivate my clinic or my medical facility to get that accreditation? Two great questions, Christina. First, you can go to Healthcare Quality Checks on the Joint Commission website. If you go to Joint Commission website, Quality Checks uh, is the um, uh, posting of what organizations are Joint Commission accredited or that have programs for answer, an example on bariatric surgery or diabetes that are certified. And there are other ways to get accredited, but here's the simple truth. We ask more. We ask more of the health systems to demonstrate that they're offering care at the highest possible level. Uh, our accreditation exam is, um, uh, it, it is tougher. Uh, and we are asking organizations to do things like evaluate healthcare equity, uh, which is particularly important for all the reasons Dr. Gold mentioned in rural America. Uh, we ask more, and we think that leads to better healthcare. Okay, eight seven 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 three one six seven three three. What does better healthcare look like to you? What are some of the areas where your rural community, the healthcare facilities that you go to when something goes wrong, how could they be improved? Let us know tonight. Also, how would you describe the quality of healthcare where you are? Give us a call, 877-731-6733. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters. After this, we're glad you're with us tonight. Stay with us. More on the other side of this break. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and our special guest tonight, President and CEO of the Joint Commission, Dr. Jonathan Perlin joins us once again. And we still have time for your call. Give us a call, let us know what's on your mind tonight. 877-731-6733. We'll go back to the phones in just a moment. Before we do so, I wanted to ask our special guest, Dr. Perlin, where do you get your recommendations and how do you go about determining the right way to do something? Our recommendations come from two places. Our recommendations come directly from Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and these are called conditions of participation. They are hurdles that healthcare organizations have to meet to be able to be part of the Medicare or Medicaid or other federal program. The second is that we go to the academic literature, the science that's produced by great universities like Nebraska that uh, tell us what practices are best. And we call those above and beyond standards. And that combination uh, is what we um, survey uh, either organizations to in an accreditation or a program, again, like diabetes or heart failure or bariatric surgery uh, for certification. Now, you asked a question that um, just before the break, what does great care look like? I get that question all the time. I uh, answer it in two ways. Um, one is, it's the kind of care you'd want for yourself and your family. More technically, Dr. Gold mentioned three attributes of excellent care, that it's safe, that it's effective, and it's patient-centered. To me, those are key pieces of the ingredients. So the sentence is this, safe, effective, patient-centered care without the need for an advocate, that the system can produce that, that the organization can produce that for you or your family member each and every time. 
I love that. I mean, sometimes we have to be our own advocates. So if even we can step out of that equation, I think we'd all love that. It makes it a little well, bit easier. Well, self-advocacy. Self-advocacy is really important. And um, I, I, I know you and Dr. Gold would agree that um, uh, we can do a better job when patients express their concerns, when families express their concerns. Uh, and we shouldn't hesitate to speak up. The irony, if we took our car to the shop, we'd say, hey, this is the problem or this is what I want. We should feel that same liberty to speak up about our needs when we go in for care. Wow, I love hearing you say that. Can you explain what is it like if you go into a rural health care facility versus something that you would see in, in urban America? Is it more difficult, would you say, to achieve this accreditation if you're in a rural part of the country? The accreditation is really calibrated to the scale of the organization. And I was thinking about um, the opportunity to be with you this evening, and thank you for this incredible opportunity. Um, but you know, over the last hundred years, medicine's become much more technical, and the great big technology has ended up in big factories. If you think about the future with artificial intelligence, with production at a smaller scale, um, uh, if you think about the way cancer care is changing from being an inpatient to an outpatient diagnosis, I see a future where actually there'll be more opportunity for rural America. I'd be interested in Dr. Gold's thoughts on that. I love that. Okay, Robert from Oklahoma joins our conversation now. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Go right ahead. I am a victim of rural health. Fell and broke my hip about three weeks ago, misdiagnosed, and it took two more days to get it diagnosed at a, at a VA facility. And my mother went to the same hospital uh, about 12 or 14 years ago and was misdiagnosed and died because of it. And there seems to be a need to be certified somehow that, that you don't misdiagnose a broken bone or infarctions that would lead to gangrene and kill a person. And that's the victim I am right now. Well, Robert, I'm certainly very sorry to hear about yourself and your mom, and uh, there is no question that we're on a journey of continuing to try to improve safety and quality and patient-centeredness uh, in all of our healthcare organizations, from the very largest to the very smallest. And anybody that would tell you that the system is perfect and it doesn't need improvement has not been delivering health care in our nation uh, up front and personal as Dr. Perlin has, and certainly I have, for over 25 years of my life. I'd like to believe, and I do believe, uh, based on statistics that I study, uh, that quality of care, safety of care, patient experience continues to get better and better every year, uh, particularly in rural areas. And I fully agree with Dr. Perlin that as more and more of this care becomes outpatient care, becomes home care, that it relies more and more on augmented intelligence and other home care attributes, that it's going to get safer and better uh, for rural America as well as for our medium-sized and, and large-sized cities. But this is a journey, and we've been on this journey for a very long time, and let's face it, we're going to be on this journey for a very long time as well. And that's where your advocacy is important, and that's what Dr. Perlin was addressing. You need to be able to be an advocate and speak up to those who deliver your care and to those people in the institution uh, that you are cared for in, or nothing will ever change. I don't know, Dr. Perlin, do you have any thoughts for our caller? Uh, Dr. Gold, I think you answered well. First, let me just add my, um, my sympathy for your, your loss of your mother and uh, for the challenge you had in care. And I, I, I do want to um, uh, reiterate what I, I thought I heard you say is that you've got the right diagnosis at VA. And one of the great success stories of, of, of our country is that the, the VA uh, has a national approach to, to health care, and um, that care can really be exemplary. So kudos to the, the VA. I'm sorry that you took a circuitous path. Uh, and uh, I think lessons for all of the viewers this evening on the importance of advocating if you don't think your medical situation has been adequately addressed. Yeah, uh, sometimes you have to really speak up for yourself, even if people around you are saying, oh, no, trust the doctors, trust the doctors, you know your body. And so it's important to always speak up.
Why are outcomes, though, often worse for our rural populations? We saw it on the graphics that Dr. Gold presented, and obviously we all have our own ideas as to why the outcomes are worse, but, but you're so articulate. Maybe you can really narrow it down for us, Dr. Perlin. Kristen, I think there are a handful of, uh, of issues that make it uh, more challenging. So much of, um, of contemporary medicine is very concentrated technology, and that technology is in the urban centers. And so there's a geography disadvantage that, um, uh, that exists. Um, you know, second, um, we know that um, many of the individuals who frankly put food on America's tables and the tables of the world um, don't have high incomes. And we know that um, uh, lower incomes, unfortunately, go hand in hand with worse health outcomes. Um, we know that in some instances, there are higher rates of, um, of, of poor diet, if not you know, by choice, but by virtue of what food may be available. Uh, we know that there are some smoking and other chronic conditions um, uh, that um, uh, may be part of the equation. And all of these things conspire to, to create challenges that um, individuals in more rural settings uh, have to face. Uh, and uh, we need to do a better job uh, as a country of thinking about how we bring the most sophisticated care to, to the patients. Uh, I know that uh, for all of the, the, the horrible uh, effects of, of COVID, uh, one benefit was the acceleration of telehealth, uh, which democratizes access to the ability to ask questions. Uh, but we've got to do a better job of figuring out uh, all of the mechanisms to link care uh, and make sure that rural Americans' health needs are, are, are met. Absolutely. And thank you for, for working on behalf of rural Americans, because this is literally life or death to them, to their it family is. members, to the people that they love and work with in their communities. And you know how tight rural communities can be. I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience tonight, Dr. Perlin? Well, well let me just share a story, um, which is that um, when I trained in the big city, um, we didn't know quite what to think of rural health care. It was only when I became a sort of practicing physician actually at a VI, we realized that the healthcare in smaller hospitals in the most rural of rural cities uh, was often some of the best because the individuals were heavily invested in the care of their communities because these were their neighbors, their cousins, their own family members. Uh, and so while there are some challenges structurally in terms of accessing technology in the big cities, uh, we know that the flip side of that is that um, it's all about community. Um, that's something that's very special in, in rural America. Let me thank you for the opportunity to, to be here with you and let me promise to keep working uh, with you uh, all and uh, with rural America in terms of making it the kind of care that we want for ourselves uh, and our families. Um, that fundamentally is the mission and the vision of the Joint Commission. Ah, well, thank you for sharing that. Dr. Gold, what are your final thoughts for our audience tonight? Well, first, of course, to thank Dr. Perlin for making time in his incredibly busy schedule uh, and, of course, for his leadership at the VA and at the Joint Commission. And just to say that this is a partnership with the small and large healthcare professionals of our country, as well as with the accrediting bodies, those that make our physicians, nurses, pharmacists better on an annual basis. And as I said a few minutes ago, this is the journey. And just like our caller said, uh, if you're uncertain or if you're uh, dissatisfied, raise your hand and ask the right questions. Uh, there are no such thing as embarrassing questions. Please, please be an active participant. And the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We all know that, especially in rural America. I want to thank you both so much for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, thanks for being with us every Monday. And Dr. Jonathan Perlin, Really enjoyed our conversation with you tonight. If we didn't get to your question, don't worry. We're back on Monday nights, every Monday night, 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 Central, right here on RFD-TV. Thanks for joining us.